Hey guys, what is up? Welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name's Austin. This is Gospel Simplicity. And I just wanted to come on here real quick to introduce you to what you're about to watch. The other day, I had the absolute privilege of sitting down with Kay Albert Little of The Cordial Catholic to have a conversation on his podcast about how Protestants and Catholics can dialogue fruitfully and how Protestants can understand the wild and weird world of Catholicism, separating just the strangeness from it from the actual arguments. Because something I'm really passionate about is bringing together Christians of various backgrounds, whether Catholic or Protestant, Orthodox, other, and bringing them together to understand one another and to really have fruitful and productive dialogue. And to have that healthy and productive dialogue, we need to understand the people we disagree with. If we don't understand their position, we're just going to end up straw manning them. And Keith was kind enough to allow me to ask him lots of questions that I had about Catholicism and to provide great answers to them. And trust me, you are going to love this, whether Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, other, you will, I really think you're going to enjoy this. But before you jump into it, I just want to say thank you so much to Keith. If you're not subscribed to The Cordial Catholic, please go do so wherever you get your podcast. Download this episode. Leave him a five-star review because he is absolutely incredible. I am so thankful to him for having me on his podcast and be sure to go show him some love. So thank you, Keith. I hope you guys enjoy this video and I'll see you soon. Hey guys, and welcome back to the show. This is going to be a fantastic conversation this week. Guys, I'm so stoked to bring you uh, this one. I am joined by a fantastic guest. Uh, he's Austin Suggs. He is a theology student at Moody uh, Bible Institute. He's an evangelical Christian. He is the host of the incredibly popular, fantastic, I don't know, the, the nicest channel on YouTube, Gospel Simplicity. Austin, I am thrilled to have you on the show. I'm a big fan. Uh, welcome. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks so much, Keith. Excited to be here. This is going to be a fantastic discussion. Uh, you know what? I find you, your videos, your channel so refreshing. And I'm excited about this conversation because I, these are the kind of things, I think these kind of conversations that are so important to have these days. And I think you'd agree. I encountered you in your first video that I saw was you talking about your experience at a Catholic Bible study. And I think for, for this discussion, for, for this video, for this podcast, I see you as kind of a stand in guy for these conversations. And what I mean by that is so often in these discussions of, of, uh, Protestantism and Catholic ideas of evangelicals and Catholics, different theology, there's this animosity or prejudice or this underlying kind of mistrust. And I get it. If we're honest about uh, Christian history, I get why those things exist. There's some kind of skepticism on both sides, and I get that. There's also this kind of underlying anti-Catholic current uh, that kind of just runs underneath kind of the surface sometimes in, in North America. And it's historic, I think, it's taken for granted sometimes. And even in the most welcoming of non-Catholic Christian churches, I, I have encountered this. I'm an evangelical convert to Catholicism. So as I was becoming Catholic and making that journey and asking those questions, I kind of came face to face with a lot of that and, and, and realized a lot of the kind of anti-Catholic mistrust that, that I had. And so... What I found so refreshing when I encountered you and your videos about going to a Catholic Bible study and going to a Catholic Mass was this, was very, very encouraging. It was somebody, a devout, an earnest, an absolutely passionate, non-Catholic Christian, evangelical, willing to openly and honestly ask these questions and to have dialogues like this and to clarify some misinformation and misunderstandings and, and to shed some light here. And that for me is, is the, the point and purpose of my podcast, why I started it. Uh, why I started blogging in the first place uh, to kind of uh, help me understand my own prejudices and misunderstandings and, and to bring light to those things too. I think so often in these discussions of theology, it's, it's simple misunderstandings. So you are the nicest guy in the world. I, I'm, I'm fairly confident that this is true. And so I'm thrilled to have you on the show to have this conversation and to shed some light on these topics. And I hope this dialogue 
is as fruitful as I imagine it being. Uh, I, I think it will be. I think listeners, I think viewers are going to love uh, this conversation. So all that to say, I hope your ego is not too inflated. But uh, you know what? You're, you're pretty humble. So it would probably be pretty hard to do that, I think. But thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you for opening up these kinds of conversations. It's, it's a great thing to do. Yeah, well, it's my pleasure. And you've only set me up for failure and hyping me up that much, but I appreciate it so much. And yeah, it's, it's been a joy to uh, just try to bring to light some of those misconceptions and try to have better conversations with our Catholic brothers and sisters, because it's such a needed thing and something that hardly ever is happening well. Um, at least on the internet, it seems there's so much division. And so my hope is to just really try to bring people together for good discussions and grateful that you're doing that. <laughs> That's awesome. And I'm surprised on the internet there's division. That just seems unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's this crazy. I must be stuck in a strange corner of the internet. I'm sure it doesn't happen in your Canadian internet. I'm sure people are nicer, but <laughs> down here in uh, American internet, it, it, it gets interesting. Yeah, we apologize a lot on Canadian internet. <laughs> Listen, so we had some questions, we had some topics we wanted to kind of talk around. Uh, and the first thing, I kind of picked your brain for some ideas of things that you, that questions you had, things you have encountered Catholics thinking and talking about, and uh, they're fantastic questions. And the first one that you wanted to talk about, I think, that you brought up in the list that you sent me, was the idea of the Mass being a sacrifice. Do you want to kind of flesh that out for the audience what were you thinking because yeah I, I i get that austin yeah yeah that was weird that was, that was one of the many catholic things i ran across and was like what do you guys mean and, and as i've interacted with um some really smart catholics i think i've started to get it but still have some questions and i think it came from uh, a video i made where i went to a mass and then a lot of people are commenting trying to help me understand and this idea of representation of an unbloody sacrifice. And at that point, my head's just kind of spinning. And I was like, I just thought we showed up to a service and thought that was, you know, <laughs> to be a little facetious there. But You've got it all figured out, it sounds like. I don't even know an answer your question. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> I think the crazy thing, and this is one of the things that, that to me, and I know a lot of, non-Catholic Christians. I'm thinking of some friends I have, conversations that I've had. Uh, I get some very angry emails sometimes, believe it or not. Mostly from Americans, yeah. not the Canadians. Uh, they're, they're sending nice sense. things. They send me donuts. I like that. Oh, I, get, I get the idea of the sacrifice being a strange thing because it, and it, it should be in a sense. The idea that there are people going around having services sacrificing things is kind of a crazy idea. Like that should definitely get our, our, our red flags flying, right? That makes sense. That's a weird, that's a weird metaphor. It definitely should get us concerned because Jesus came and died on the cross and that sacrifice was finished once and for all. So anybody walking around saying, well, we have to crucify Christ again or we have to sacrifice him again or do something to, to make that better or improve that uh, is, is a wacky thing to think. And I can remember, I can remember like, like my understanding of what Catholics were doing in, in a mass uh, when I was a younger evangelical was this, I, this weird kind of Jewish uh, pharisaical kind of like ritual mm. type thing happening, right? Like we would have compared that what was happening there to the Pharisees. We would have, that would have been the, the strongest comparison. Like those Catholics, they 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 know about Jesus. They know about God. Like they're they're working things out. They're working the salvation out there, right? Which is another uh, I think misconception. Uh, not trusting in Christ for sure, but then doing these weird kind of sacrifices and things that that like we're done with that. That's over. Um, but I think you nailed it. I think you already know the answer to this question. <laughs> for the sake of for the sake of people listening, I uh, I can put more more meat on those bones with, with the idea that yeah. The, the mass is, and this took, took a while for me to understand, I think even after I became Catholic, the, the mass is the, the centerpiece of, of everything for the, in the life of the Catholic, because that's where the Eucharist takes place. And I think, I think as 
a non-Catholic Christian, as an evangelical, as a non-denominational Christian, I saw communion, right, as this thing we do maybe once a month. Some churches, I mean, an Anglican church maybe, or a Lutheran church, it would happen every service, potentially, depending on the, the variety of Anglican and Lutheran church, right? Sure. But it was seen as this kind of memorial thing that, that we would do to commemorate the crucifixion and what Christ did. And, and in some cases, because he told us to do it, we didn't even know why we were doing it. We would just do it, right? Which is good. Like, we should do things that God tells us to do. That's fine. Sure. Uh, but for the, for the Catholic, like, what I've come to understand is, is the centerpiece. Like, it is, it is like the manna in, in the wilderness for the Israelites. It's, it's the food for the journey. And you're going to die if you don't have that food for the journey. And how it's understood in the Catholic world is, it, it is, yes, this, this is a sacrifice. Because when you, when you commemorate a covenant, there's a sacrifice that takes place. There, this is the pattern that we see in the Old Testament, that when God uh, is establishing covenants, some kind of sacrifice happens, some kind of sacrificial meal that takes place. And so what the Catholic Church sees as taking place is at the Last Supper, Jesus kind of became the new Passover lamb for us, right? Uh, at the cross, kind of finished that with his crucifixion. And so what the Mass is, and I'll try and say this well. I should say, I mean, before we get into anything, I'm not a theologian. <laughs> Normally on this, on this podcast, on my show, I am speaking to people who are much more intelligent than I am. So these kind of conversations are are out of my comfort zone for sure so, so i well, may likewise. i may say things yeah that's a good point i may say things that are totally bonkers and people write into the show or com comment on the video and be like what is this guy talking about and uh, uh mea culpa i'm sorry in advance i'm gonna try the best i know to explain these things so disclaimer What's, what's happening in the Mass, and this really blew my mind when I began to understand this, is like you said, this representation of this kind of cosmic sacrifice that, that Christ accomplished on the cross. So I want to say this properly. What happens is when the priest is saying the words of Christ that Christ said at the Last Supper, uh, during the Mass, we call that the consecration, when he takes the, the bread and the wine and, and says the words that Christ said over those, that bread and wine. The same words from the Gospels. He says these words, uh, this kind of prayer. What happens there is we believe that in, at that moment, we are actually present. So Christ isn't being re-sacrificed at this new Last Supper that's taking place here. It's not as if the priest is, is acting out this Last Supper and and re-sacrificing Christ in that bread and wine, what's happening is we're cosmically like transported to the actual Last Supper, to the actual crucifixion. Uh, we're, we're joined together with that. Uh, we're like mystically present in this time-bending kind of way. And so it is a sacrifice. The Mass is a sacrifice because it's a sacrificial meal commemorating the, the new covenant, we believe that because that's what Catholics believe Jesus was was doing at the Last Supper. He was he was establishing this sacrificial meal that he was the Lamb. But it's not as if we are re-crucifying Christ or doing some weird pagan kind of sacrificial type ceremony. What what we believe is happening is we're actually mystically present in this crazy mind time space bending way at the foot of the cross, you know, where, where, where Mary and, and the beloved disciple would have been there watching Christ uh, be crucified and take his last breath. We believe that we're actually present at that. And like you said, this is a representation. So we do believe, and this is getting maybe far afield, that the, the bread and the wine become Jesus is crazy. I know. But that's not a new Jesus. That's not as if like we're re-crucifying Jesus to, to get this new bread and wine. We believe that he's given himself once and for all for us. And we're being joined into that one sacrifice when we receive that, that, those aspects of him. Uh, and it's a crazy thing. I mean, I had 
a massively brilliant theologian on the show named Dr. Lawrence Feingold, who's written this enormous, like these two 800 page books, one on like the church, one on uh, the Eucharist. He's writing more on the sacraments. He's a brilliant theologian. And in his book on the Eucharist, he says that the sacrificial aspect of the mass is the most difficult aspect for, for the reformers at the reformation and for most non-Catholic Christians to get, because it just sounds crazy that there, that there's this sacrifice taking place like that. It should get us kind of like, Whoa, what's, what's happening. But then, you know, he goes on to explain in this book, he traces out the history of, yeah, that, that, that kind of is how it was always believed to be. And yeah, that got reformers backs up and they got a little like, mm, this is sketchy. We're not super sure. Cause the church at that time was doing probably a pretty terrible job of explaining what was happening. And, and it sounded and looked like not a good thing. So I get why people were like, Oh, this is like not cool. Uh, but it is, you know, kind of the way that it was seen in the beginning and carried on for, for thousand and a half years. And, uh, but it sounds crazy, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. And I think that's, more or less where the question came from less from it and i might like disappoint every protestant listener right now and so i should also give the disclaimer of i do not by any means represent the best of protestantism uh, not even close so forgive me uh, but i you know i think when i was typing up that question it was less of this like long and well thought out theological reflection on why this can't be true and more of like this is weird. Like this, this feels strange. Uh, you probably just heard the lovely city of Chicago outside the door there, but it's, yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of things like that with Catholicism as I've kind of encountered it. And I talked about that a little bit in the Bible study video that I made, like with the prayers to Mary. And while there are theological things around that, that I'm not fully on board with, I think a lot of it comes down to the sense of like, this all feels very foreign and very strange. And we get the sense of like, whoa, 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 like this isn't the Christianity I'm used to. Um, and I think the process that I'm trying to go through right now is kind of dissecting that from, okay, this is weird, but what are my like substantial criticisms of this? Um, and so it's been really helpful listening to your podcast and others like it to, uh, to get good answers on that. And so I appreciate you going through that. <laughs> I love that approach that you're taking. This is again, so refreshing. And <laughs> And so important. I mean, I was having a discussion with a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, and I've learned this too. I don't know if you've encountered this before, uh, but it's often the people who you're closest with, who you are, who are your best friends sometimes, who it's hardest to uh, to debate or dialogue with effectively because you just know them too well sometimes. I have a very good friend who's yeah. an evangelical Christian. Um, we're the, the best of friends. I I became Catholic during part of our friendship i've known him for for forever i don't want to d date myself and 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 shock the listeners i know i i look like a spring chicken but i'm I'm getting up there and uh spring chicken see you say things like spring chicken and everyone knows you're not a young guy because you're saying weird things i think you gave it away there yeah i definitely did we're good friends <laughs> this guy and i and and we when we try and dialogue about catholic things it is this, it isn't, doesn't end well, usually. But like you said, it's separating the, the weirdness of Catholicism from actual substantive criticism. I think that's a, a great way of putting it because he gets hooked up or he gets caught up on the weirdness. We'll have a dialogue about something, scripture or tradition, and he'll just throw out a comment randomly like, oh, you, you guys believe like in praying to Mary and worshiping saints. Like, that's crazy. And I'm like, no, 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 we're talking about like, a completely different topic right now. Like, like let's, let's back it up. But it's like getting caught in the weirdness. It's like, okay, you're saying things I understand, but it's just weird. I just, I just don't, I don't get it. But I think your approach is so humbling and, and, and so humble, I should say, to realize that there are weird things that Catholics do. We do a, a lot of weird things. Uh, but there are things that you can realize, okay, this is weird, but what are my actual problems with this what are my actual like substantive criticisms of this that's an amazing approach and i think we can get so far in understanding each other and explaining things 
so well with an approach like that. that that's so refreshing. This is why you're the nicest guy on YouTube. See, I wasn't, I wasn't wrong. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Yeah, and I really think, it, at least for me, it's allowed me to learn so much more because if I come in this just guns a-blazing, like all my Protestant friends would like me to, <laughs> Um, I, I don't learn anything. Like if I come in just like they're wrong about everything and I don't like they're wrong, but they're crazy. Like that, that's not going to help me at all in my understanding of it. And so if I really want to interact with this well, I think there's a certain amount of charity of like, okay, like weirdness aside, what are the best arguments for this? And how do I, how do I engage with those rather than just these caricatures, which I think really abound for Catholicism. And I mean, in fairness, I think in a way, a lot of those, at least in my upbringing came from, I knew a lot of Catholics in name, but I, and this, I'm, I don't mean this like in a proud way at all, but I don't think um, many of them could explain much of anything about Catholicism. They went on <laughs> Christmas and Easter. Uh, and so I think growing up, it wasn't like, there was never this intellectual side to the disagreement. It was like, and this sounds terrible. And I've now interacted with so many intelligent Catholics who could make me look so terrible. Um, but it wasn't even like Catholics are wrong. It was like, oh, like that, that's unfortunate. Like they got born into this like weird thing where they worship Mary, but like I'll show them a couple Bible verses and we'll, we'll settle this. Uh, but, but it's been really great to interact with some of the better ideas because I'm, I'm a full blown nerd, like no, no doubt about it. And so to, to get to read great sources and to go through it, um, it's just been really helpful for me. So. <laughs> You're in great nerd company here. So this is fantastic. Look, my, my running joke was in high school. Uh, and now I should, I should put a disclaimer on here that I did not, didn't do drugs in high school. But if you wanted to get drugs, it was the Catholic high school kids you'd ask for the best drugs because they were the guys who knew where to find it. Like that was my, that was my, my running joke about the, the guys who went to Catholic school. Uh, so not only were they... Catholic in name, like they were the guys that were partying the hardest, that were living the most unChrist-like life. Uh, I became, uh, I became, I was saved in high school, so I became an evangelical Christian in about tenth grade or so. Uh, I don't know if that changes in, in, into American speak. We call it grade ten. I don't know what you guys call that. Second year of high school, works. whatever. Yep. And uh, you know, I, I was, I was in the punk rock scene. I was, but as a Christian kid. So I was trying to live life for Christ. I was trying to be a good witness to my, to my peers. And I'd see these Catholic guys and Catholic girls just, I mean, it, they weren't even in my mind, not Christians. They were just, they were just in many cases, just terrible people, like, like just mean and like not nice and into all kind of the, the worst kind of stuff of that, that punk scene that we were a part of. And so if you would have, yeah, if you would have, I mean, yeah, there, there is this, and I don't think that, I don't think that any Catholic is, is going to roll their, roll their eyes or disagree with you on that point uh, or me, because I'm agreeing with you that there is this, this, yeah, this whole swath of Catholics who are born into this thing uh, who don't represent what Catholicism actually is very well. I mean, that's a whole, I mean, that's a whole other podcast. That's a whole series of podcasts on, on why that's the case. Um, there's all kinds of reasons. And a lot of them are just simply bad, bad catechesis, bad formation, not enough yeah. being told what's going on. And there's a substantial shift I'm seeing uh, these days, especially as more evangelicals become Catholic, because we're bringing the best of like the Bible and the best of like, hey, we got to like teach this stuff. I don't, now I feel a little bit like, uh, uh, what's the word? Not humble at this point. I'm just mean like I'm fixing Catholicism. That's not the case. What I'm trying to say is I think this tide is shifting, but you're right. There is this notion where so many of the Catholics you may meet as a non-Catholic Christian might be these Catholics who don't represent the faith, don't know the faith, couldn't defend the faith or intellectually engage with somebody who could. We used to evangelize these people on campus uh, when I was in university and just, just I don't know, walk all over them. We, we'd come out guns blazing at that point, just like, you guys don't know anything. Like, boom, 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 boom. Here's all these different verses. Like, what are you guys doing? And they'd get tr trounced over because they didn't know their faith or how to, how to, to, to dialogue about it, right? So 
I think, I mean, these kind of dialogues, I think are so important for those reasons. I mean, I, I don't, it's important to shed light on, on what I as a Catholic believe, what Catholics actually believe. And I guess like you mentioned before, and I think this is again, so humble of you. That's why the nicest guy on YouTube is you don't represent all, all Protestants, right? You can't, I don't represent all Catholics. Um, the, the interesting thing is I can grab a book off my shelf that tells, it tells me what all Catholics believe, which is cool. It's the catechism of the Catholic church. It's kind of the compendium of all Catholic teaching. And I guess there is, I mean, there is a standard by which we can say, yeah, these guys are kind of bad Catholics. These guys are kind of good Catholics. This is what Catholics do believe. This is what they don't believe. This is how they should act based on this kind of uh, a standard of what Catholics actually believe. And I think, I'm saying this wrong, I think, because I'm not, I don't want to call anybody a bad Catholic necessarily. Again, I am like, this is like Mr. Nice Guy and Mr. Grumpy, like, Grumpy Catholic no. dude, uh, <laughs> conversation. I feel like I'm being such a grouch. But what I'm trying to say is for people that see Catholics not living out the Catholic faith or see Catholics who, who are in kind of Catholics who can't defend the faith or explain the faith, there is a place that has the answer, which is kind of cool. The, the objective answers to what Catholics believe in the catechism. So when I'm in a conversation with somebody or in a debate about something or having a dialogue, I'll often say, hey, if you have a question, just go to the catechism because so that'll answer it for you. Forget the person you see doing this the wrong way or the person who's said this and might sound a little sketchy and probably isn't accurate. There's a place you can go to find those answers. And mostly it's full of uh, scripture quotations, which is also a bit surprising, uh, was for me. But it's kind of cool because there is a place to go to answer those questions apart from what somebody might misinterpret and what I might misinterpret. I might tell you the totally wrong thing. Uh, but you can check the catechism to find out if I was right or, right or wrong. Yeah. You can see how, how accurate I was. Um, so it's cool that exists. I mean, that's kind of the, the counterbalance to badly formed Catholics spouting off ideas that aren't necessarily true is you can go somewhere to check what Catholics actually believe from this objective kind of source. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. And I think that's really helpful. You can't actually see it, but maybe in my other shot, I actually have the catechism of the Catholic church sitting there to give me some street cred. Um, with. <laughs> but uh, it, it, you know, it's interesting you bring that up because I don't want to out this professor, so I won't mention him by name. But I was in his class the other day at Moody Bible Institute, which like, if you're familiar with Moody, we're about as conservative as it gets. And he's talking about the, you know, not trying to glaze over the differences, which I think is important in these ecumenical conversations. But he challenged us all. He said, you know, go home and read the Lutheran Concord. And he's like, most of you aren't Lutheran, but you'll find you agree with more of it than you think. It's like, and then grab yourself a copy of the Catechism of the Catholic Church and read it. He's like, and you'll find two things said first, and I hope this doesn't come across poorly, you'll find that many Catholics don't live out what it says in the catechism, or they don't fully understand that. And I think that's what we we're kind of getting at. And he's like, and second, you'll find that while you disagree with a decent amount of it, there's mo much more agreement than you would have thought. And it's not all as crazy as you, as you think. Now he's also an Anglican, so my Protestant friends might you know, discount that, but he's a professor at Moody, so I think that counts for something. <laughs> That's a great point. And, and that goes to what I was saying. I mean, the Catholics wouldn't, I mean, there was a survey done recently on, on the Eucharist, what Catholics understand. I think it was a Pew Research Institute, uh, Pew Research Survey, yeah. on what Catholics believe about the Eucharist. And I can tell you for a fact, the catechism, catechism would tell you that Catholics believe that becomes Jesus, flesh, blood, soul, divinity. We are consuming that. Um, I know, super weird, but that's what we believe. And the catechism will tell you that, but the amount of Catholics that actually believe that based on the Pew Research Survey was, was shockingly low. So, I mean, the response by good theologians and good publishing houses and good, uh, good parishes, I mean, people who are plugged into this kind of thing and, and saw the results of that survey was like, oh my goodness, we have work to do. Let's get like, we have to inform people. Let's just preach for the next three years on the Eucharist as as actually what we says what we say it is to help those catholics to, to learn that because so few knew that but you're right your professor is right right what's in there not everybody 
who calls himself Catholic even even understands or knows about. Um, the cool thing is that it exists and it's objectively there. So you can measure that against what you might hear some random person say. Uh, yeah, and I think there, there's a lot in there that, uh, that there's agreement around. I mean, there's a lot in there. And even if there's not agreement, I mean, I, I say this often on the show and I don't know who it comes from. I, I, I credit my good friend, John DeRosa. I think he said it. Uh, he's the host of the Classical Theism podcast, fantastic deep okay. dives into Catholic uh, Christian ideas. And I think it was him that said, you might not agree with the answer the Catholic Church presents on any number of subjects, but there is an answer and it is often a really robust answer. So my good friend who throws out the question like, well, you worship Mary, right? I, I could answer that in a sentence for him. Uh, the catechism does it in pages and pages that explains what we believe about the saints and intercession and, and how Christ fits in that. And those things go through those saints to him and he answers those prayers and all this stuff. I mean, it, you might not agree with the answer and my friend probably wouldn't be convinced because we're, we're good friends and we like to debate and argue, but, but there is an answer uh, I think is what the, the profound thing is that, that I realized, right? There's, might not agree with it, but there is often a very profound and deep answer as to why that thing is done. It's not just kind of, we've decided to do this willy nilly uh, for no reason. There's, there's, there's reasons, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. And I think that's helpful for Protestants to understand and something that I found out in my research, which is all very new after my, you know, entirely evangelical channel became predominantly Catholic <laughs> through a couple of videos and it's been a wild ride. <laughs> Uh, but understanding that, well, while I might not agree with all the reasons, these things aren't just like popping up out of thin air. And I think that's helpful in any conversation with anyone, just in empathizing with people, is understanding that chances are what that person believes makes sense to them. Doesn't mean it's true, but it goes a long way in being able to have a reasonable conversation if you don't go in assuming that they're just like willfully wrong and or just lacking basic intelligence. Uh, I think it just helps the conversations. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great point. And I guess the flip side of this, I can, I, can, I can hear listeners kind of taking that question and twisting it around and saying, well, no, it didn't pop up overnight. It's based on this tradition and it's based on the thing you've always done a certain way. And, and while that can be certainly something that Catholics would hold up as saying like, yes, this is why it's important. It's been done forever. That could also be a criticism right? Well, you, you're steeped in that tradition. Like you've done, this is a thing that you just do because you've always done it. Uh, doesn't make it right. It makes it like you're just stuck in rituals and rites and repeating these things over and over again. Um, does that make sense? Oh yeah, for sure. And I, you know, to segue, that kind of reminds me of one of the questions that I put down for you, which Seems like such a silly question and embarrassing for a theology major, but I can get over myself pretty quickly. So just the idea of tradition. So I, I get like the image of the like three-legged stool with the magisterium and the scripture and tradition. Like I get that. I've seen a stool. I understand magisterium, scripture, tradition. At, at times I'm like, okay, that makes sense. It's like the history of what has been believed. But then we get into these distinctions of capital T tradition and lowercase t tradition and what exactly that ends up looking like. Because, you know, if someone were to describe it as tradition is the history of interpretation of the Bible, I think every Protestant is like, that's really useful. But I think it goes beyond that. And I struggle to sometimes pin down exactly what is being meant by this ambiguous thing of tradition <laughs> i love that you said you've seen a stool that was my favorite part of that <laughs> thank you yeah you know i just want to specify I, I get it guys i've seen a stool like i'm done like you <laughs> you'd be surprised the questions i get on youtube so you know, it's worth yeah. a, has, has this guy seen a stool before <laughs> so so oh, that man. yeah i've used that analogy before i teach the uh, the class for new catholics so people becoming catholic at my parish and i've used that that image before of the stool um where you know the tradition and uh, bible and the magisterium go 
as a three-legged stool, right? Take it, any of those legs and the stool falls over unless you can balance really well, whatever. I don't know how, how far the, the metaphor works. Um, yeah. So it's a fascinating subject. And I guess, I mean, this, this is for me really how I first began asking questions about the Catholic Church. Um, I mean, listeners to my podcast will know I, I say it every week, but it was a it was an evangelical pastor I was working for at the time who, who asked me, um, and I later learned that he was on a journey of his own. He was doing his one of his master's degrees and looking at church history, and he was raised Catholic, had left the Catholic church, became mm -hmm. an, a Protestant pastor, and he was looking at these church history documents and kind of questioning his own journey. So he asked me, like, you know, what's more important? the Bible or tradition. And of course I was like, the Bible, what do you mean? Like the answer for every Sunday school question, right? Is the Bible or Jesus. So I'm like, do I get <laughs> fired for answering this differently? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, is it the test? Like, so I said the Bible and then he said, well, who put together the Bible? Uh, wasn't it, wasn't it the tradition of the church? And that's kind of where my, where my journey started. And I think that's kind of a good way of, of, segueing into an answer maybe mm -hmm. because what what tradition i mean and it's true like you 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 have a difficult time explaining the bible apart from tradition because the bible has a table of contents it has a collection of books it had to get put together in some form or fashion people had to decide upon what went in there and we have documents down through the early church that give us some indication certain people wrote certain things this this belongs here we have different lists from different people, different, you know, early, early Christians. But at some point, it had to get collected into, uh, you know, what books belong, what books don't belong. And so what the what the Catholic Church would say is, it, 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 that is part of the tradition. The, you know, collecting scripture to begin with was part of the tradition. It was voted on by by bishops and councils. These bishops would have been successors of the the apostles who would have then passed on their teaching office and authority um, to make up this kind of this this link this lineage which then at some point realized okay we have all these different books different scriptures we have you know the the epistle um, to uh, to James we have we have these different gospels we have other epistles things that Paul's written things that John's written things that Peter's written. We have this weird thing called revelation. We're like, what do we even do with this? And at some point, they would have, you know, got together and decided on what goes into that, that the Bible and, and kind of close that canon. Never mind the question of, of the Old Testament, which Catholic and, and Protestant Bibles are different again for all kinds of reasons. Sure. So, I mean, that's, a, that's one view, view of tradition that would have, to begin with, kind of collected something here but i guess to step back a little bit i think how how the church understands this is that the word of god so jesus is the word of god jesus mm -hmm. you know came down he, he he taught us things he, he taught us all kinds of stuff he didn't write anything down but we call him the, the word of god that was collected then in the bible which we call also the word of god right because it, it's mm -hmm. the words of jesus there's a, there's a there's a link there between the word of god as as christ and as the as the bible right there, there's a link yeah. there where catholics take that is then that word of god is not just written in the bible but it also is this thing called tradition this thing that's kind of guides the church and i think the best way of understanding what that really means is the idea of the of the magisterium that you mentioned, which kind of is this. So this this shocked me to learn because I thought that you know Matthias was the the, the extra apostle after mm -hmm. Judas left, and then he just disappeared into the sunset, just kind of you know went off. And little did I know, <laughs> I know that the Catholic Church believes that those apostles actually appointed successors when they died. And we see this with, with Matthias. Uh, and we see this, we see Paul doing this with Timothy. We see this happening in other places. These, these apostles didn't just uh, die and then their office was gone. The, the apostolic age ended, the, the age of the apostles ended uh, when they all died, but they, their offices carried on. So they ordained people, they laid hands on people and sent those people out. 
those people call themselves bishops, which is kind of crazy. Uh, even in the walls of the New Testament, we see the same Greek word used uh, to mean uh, like elder often or like teaching person or, or uh, um, whatever it might be. But the word is the same word that translates from the Greek and English as bishop, which is kind of crazy. I had no idea that word is in the New Testament. And so those people pass on their office. And, you know, these writers in the early church understood themselves to be bishops and successors to the apostles and had the authority and exercised that authority, wrote letters to churches in kind of the same way that Paul did and Peter and, and John do in the New Testament. They kind of kept that authority going. And so I guess the best way of understanding tradition is kind of that, that handed on, kind of passed on thing. In one sense, how we interpret the Bible. There's a certain tradition to that, how it's always been kind of interpreted. Uh, you know, Catholics would say too, because we have a lot of weird things going on. We have Mary and the saints and like this crazy, this crazy stuff, right? I mean, like we get into Marian theology, it gets bonkers town. But what Catholics would say is everything is present in, everything is present at least in seed form in the Bible. Um, but that the church is also the one that kind of guided and put that Bible together as part of that tradition that was passed on to the apostles. And so it's kind of a, a, a two thing, a two pronged thing going on there um, that here's the Bible, but also here's how we understand it to be interpreted. And the way we understand it to be interpreted, is kind of that thing that's been passed on down the line. We call it the magisterium. Um, but it kind of guides us and helps us to know how to interpret the Bible. I mean, magisterium is, is, a, is a big topic, but basically it's those bishops in, in, uh, in union with the Pope kind of making decisions on what things mean and how to understand different things. So all, all kinds of issues and modern issues like AI and like robot androids and new like biotech for um, for like reproduction and contraception and all kinds of things that are, are, are new and emerging. Uh, the bishops get together and decide on, on this, this stuff and exercise that power that they believe, the church believes, was invested in the first apostles and, um, and then passed down. So I don't know if I answered your question a little bit. I mean, it's kind of, it is a kind of a nebulous thing, the idea of tradition, but I think it's best understood in the context of authority, of the authority of what the Catholic Church believes that it, it has and is, which is this church that Christ founded, passed kind of on in authority down through the apostles. And then the tradition, I mean, is kind of what, what that church keeps alive and understands the scriptures to mean. And in the beginning, I mean, understands what the scriptures are kind of to begin with. I think it's kind of this weird idea of it's hard to detach scripture from tradition because scripture kind of lives almost within tradition because it's a certain you know this is why it's kind of weird that catholics and protestants have different sized bibles in the old testament because catholics would say well like this is you know the same tradition that put together whatever this new testament here we put these books in here, the old testament but then there's this kind of like thing going on here but that's that's an aside am i making any sense because i feel like I'm not. And this is why I'm not usually the person speaking on my podcast. I sit back while somebody else does most of the talking. You undersell yourself, Keith. No, that was, that was really helpful. Yeah. And I think, I mean, there was so much there. I, I don't even know I'm where sorry. to start. But I, no, no, not at all. That was a good thing. That was a compliment. Um, oh, thanks. Yeah. Anytime. I, yeah, I think that's helpful to understand. And I, I appreciate that there's like you kind of recognize there is still a certain like unwieldiness that might not be the right term but it, it's difficult to pin down what exactly this thing is like I can't put tradition in a box necessarily and say like like I can point at the bible and now mine might have what 66 verses what do you guys have 73 is that right I, uh, more yeah more than like you that. yeah the bibles are bigger <laughs> look at yeah uh, but, you know, I, I can point at the Bible and say, like, that's the Bible. Uh, but tradition, I think, gets a little more difficult to, to pin down there. And I think, I think you also hit on another thing to kind of jump a little bit, but the idea of authority. And we talked about this a little bit beforehand. Um, and for me, as a Protestant, I mean, there's, 
there's a lot of things that I'm like, yeah, I'm just not fully on board with that. Like I see where you're coming from, but no, I, I don't see it that way. But I think the real crux of the issue, if we were to like boil it down, is that idea of authority. Like I can sit here all day and be like, Marian dogmas seem strange. But if you convinced me of the authority of the church, well, then that's kind of a moot point. Because if I'm convinced of the, I mean, I guess there's layers to it. So you convinced me that Peter is the first Pope. And then if I was convinced that through apostolic su succession, that's passed down and that somehow through, <laughs> I'm not, I don't want to like poorly represent it, but at least in my mind, um, through, I guess the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ maintains his church in doctrinal truth so that, that the magisterium as they're teaching authoritatively are still teaching what is true. Um, then I think at that point, if you convince a Protestant of those different things, then you kind of have to accept those outliers. Uh, at least in my head, I don't see how I could be convinced of that and everything else not fall into place. Now, granted, I'm still a Protestant and I haven't found that central thing to be entirely convincing. Um, but I think that's, if I was a Catholic apologist, that's where I'd be trying to hit on. That's a good tip. I appreciate that. Sure. <laughs> that's a that's a incredibly insightful uh, insight you've had there. Yeah, truly, I, I'm thinking of I had this phenomenal uh, Calvinist Bible scholar, uh, Dr. John Bergsma, who went to Calvin College. To that one. Went to Calvin College, and uh, encountered some Catholic guys, and his route to becoming Catholic was he read one of the early church fathers. So these are the guys, I didn't know these guys existed. I don't know about you. I was just shocked to learn that there were writings that were immediately after the letters and stuff in the new Testament that people were writing stuff. And we have those, we have those things. The book is like a dollar to buy on, on ebook on like Amazon of like thousands and thousands of pages of the early church fathers. Um, guys who were, who were, like taught by the apostles, which is crazy. These exist. And it blew my mind to, to find this out. And I think he was reading St. Ignatius of Antioch, who was um, a disciple of, uh, of one of the people who heard John preach. So very early Polycarp, on. Polycarp, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. I think he was a disciple of Polycarp. See, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. You're a genius. Yeah. <laughs> he was. And, and he writes this one line in one of his letters as he's approaching his death, uh, about the idea of, you know, how do you find the church? Well, the church is where the bishop is and where the Eucharist is celebrated. And I remember what Dr. Bergsma said was, once I read that, you know, I was, I was convinced of the authority of the Catholic church, because where else is there the bishop who has a lineage going back to this time? And where else is there the Eucharist? So like you say, he was kind of convinced of the authority of the Catholic church based on reading this early church document and recognizing like, well, that didn't end. That must be somewhere. Where can I find this? And like you said, once he became convinced of that, everything else kind of fell in place for him. This is a guy who's, who'd spent his life studying the Bible uh, at a really in great depth. Um, he's a phenomenal scholar, but even with that in mind, like all his academic training and stuff in mind, he said, yeah, once he became convinced of the authority, everything else kind of fell into place. And that is kind of like the hardest, I mean, the, the, it's true. That's kind of how it went for me too, right? I, I, and, and I think so many people, that's the route that it goes. Once you kind of crack that or understand that or come to recognize that or, or ex I guess accept those premises, accept the, the argument that this Catholic Church is what it says it is, if it is that, like if, if, because the Catholic Church believes that the bishop, and I've had a couple of bishops on the show, I, and I have friends with some bishops, which is phenomenal. It's fun to know them. You know, they believe that they have the authority when they're working in union with each other to, to bind and loose in a real serious way. Like, you know, they take the charge that Christ gave to the apostles and to Peter in particular to bind and loose. They understand that as the ability to to teach, uh, to teach doctrine, um, you know, one way or the other kind of thing. But that's a, that's an authoritative statement, and it was. It was you know that's that's the same language that the rabbis would have been using to to explain how they teach Jewish believers. So Christ was giving 
the apostles an authority. Like we, like, I think all Christians understand that. Um, the Catholic Church says, yeah, and that kept going. Like one apostle would lay hands on a, a, a new bishop and appoint him to lead a church, and that would keep going. Down to like my, you know, my buddy Bishop Thomas Dowd from Montreal, who says, yeah, I, you know, I believe that I know I've been ordained by a bishop as, you know, his successor. I am now a bishop. It's kind of crazy, but I have this ability to to teach authoritatively. Which, which is shocking and crazy, but if, but if once I got to that point of, of saying, yeah, you know what, I agree with that, I, I've, looking at the history, looking at, uh, you know, the biblical evidence for that, looking at the early church evidence for that, once you become convinced of that, I think you're right. I think everything else kind of falls in place. And those weird things, those weird Marian dogmas and those strange things that Catholics do and like all these weird you know, there's been a lot of weird miracles that have happened and kind of crazy things that you that you suddenly are a part of this crazy church. Yeah, those things kind of fall into place. And I know a lot of, I know a lot of converts, a lot of Catholics who are like, you know what, I, I believe this claim of the church and everything else. I don't quite get it yet, but I'm going to get it. And I, and I accept this. I accept that they're right on, on this, 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 and this. And so, okay. But you're right that that is the central claim that you have to to agree with or disagree with. And I think again, like well put, I think. And again, separate that from the weirdness, right? Because if Catholics are right on that thing, then that deserves some serious critical kind of looking at, you know, if that that claim apart from all the weird things they do. So again, talking to my buddy, right, who got hung up on, on the saints and Mary. Yeah, that's weird. It looks really, really weird. Like, you know, the most, often the most devout and earnest Catholic, like the worst Christian ever to a non-Catholic Christian. Because, because you know, I'm, I'm kneeling in front of a statue, praying like a rosary, right, with like, wearing a scapular with like icons all around, right? And like lighting candles and doing weird kind of things. It looks crazy to a non-Catholic Christian, but that Catholic could be the most devout and earnest Catholic ever, but the way they worship looks crazy. So put that aside, like put that stuff aside for now and look at that, those central claims. You know, read what the catechism actually says about those claims, apart from, you know, what this weird guy kneeling you know, in this dark church <laughs> might look like, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. No, I, I think, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And again, there's a couple of things you hit on there that I think were really helpful. But yeah, I think, again, as like an outsider, I guess the place where I've gotten to is going from like Catholicism, like, oh, that's unfortunate. Like those people, like they just don't understand. <laughs> to like, okay, like there's serious claims being made here. Well, let's figure out what the root of this is and like give it's worth giving serious thought to and i that's what i would encourage i think like i don't think as protestants we should be scared to do that because if it's not like our claim is that it's not true and if we go into that like we shouldn't be scared of finding the truth and if jesus is the way the truth and the life like i don't think truth should scare scare us um so yeah, I think that unsettles some people in my approach to it on my channel. Um, I think it upsets Protestants and maybe makes Catholics overexcited. Uh, I get a lot of comments like, welcome home. I'm like, a little premature there. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks. Or people just saying, cross the Tiber. And I have a running offer for anyone that wants to buy me a plane ticket to Italy. Love to uh, go for a swim in an Italian river. But um, yeah, and I think I think, again, yeah, that idea of authority is at the center of it. And then the other things fall into place. Something that came to mind as you were talking about that was this, uh, something to illustrate that is just the other day, I made a video on John 2. And I like go through different books of the Bible, one chapter at a time. And in that, you know, you see Mary asking Jesus to do something for the wedding. And like as a Protestant, I see that as like Mary makes this simple request, like, okay, th there's not a whole lot to go on here. But then I get all these Catholic comments and, and it, as far as like, this is the basis for intercession and all this. And based on my Protestant, like conceptions of how hermeneutics work, like this is crazy. But then if I step back for a second, 
and give the benefit of the doubt and put the you know shoe on the other foot or however that saying goes like if i accepted the authority of the church that this was true then i could see how you could make these biblical cases for them because you're not requiring the bible to be the sole place for like that seed idea that you put in there and i think that's helpful for protestants to understand because for me as a bible college student i look at that i'm like this is crazy interpretation but when you have those both sets of things going on there, you're able to kind of allow them to work symbiotically, I think. I could be totally misrepresenting Catholicism. No, I think you hit an amazing thing. And and yeah, I think where tradition comes into play for that is that, and this, you know, because there's so much in John. I mean, I love the Gospel of John and I love your YouTube channel and you're, and you're digging into these things. This is fantastic. I, I, there's so much in there, right? And I don't want to go too far into this, this single account sure. in the gospel, but I mean, there's so much in that account, right? That makes almost no sense to, made no sense to me as an evangelical looking at my Bible and reading it. And I'd, I'd read commentaries on this and I'd read, you know, studies on this and be like, what's going on here? And, and, and no one quite could make sense of it. But suddenly you you open the the door on like the Catholic view of something like that, and where it's rooted is again in this tradition. So, what what shocks me to 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 learn about something like John two is very early on in in the history of Christianity, the the very early Christians were knew right away what was happening here, which was crazy. We we kind of lost that down through time, I think, and and some of those sources. I don't know, we're prejudiced against kind of accessing those. I mentioned the early church fathers earlier, right? I, would, I wouldn't have gone to the early church fathers to, to figure out how, what they understood John 2 to mean, for example. But if you go there, you see, oh my goodness, they understood right away that Mary is the new Eve and that this, this exchange between her and Jesus is when Jesus calls her woman. Like that was always so confusing to me. But what the earliest Christians understood that to mean was he was calling her woman, not out of disrespect, because he can't break the commandment that says honor your mother and father. He can't break that. He's Jesus. He's perfect. So he can't call her woman and disrespect her. He's calling her woman to, to signal that idea of the first woman being Eve. And here's this wedding banquet where the new Eve is, in a sense, being presented who is Mary, who then will later on trample the serpent, you know, to kind of finish the the end of the game and like level up, you know, defeat the boss at the end. In Revelation, we see the idea of, you know, the woman and crushing the serpent's head. This, you know, but all of, all of that, yeah, that is, the, that is where tradition comes in because all of that, I, it, it does seem crazy to read those things into that, but that is kind of, where where tradition kind of makes a play and it's not that the catholic church is bringing all these kind of weird extra things it's that they're they're looking at how this was understood in in many times many cases from from the beginning from kind of the earliest christians understood this and let's not like reinvent the wheel i guess kind of is the idea but let's understand how they understood it and then how it was understood kind of down through time i mean even the idea of, of the Eucharist is mirrored in the multiplication of the wine, like miraculously, right? It's supposed to be a prefiguring of the Eucharist. And then later when he feeds the 5,000, it's meant to be a prefiguring of, of the bread with the, uh, at the Last Supper and in the Eucharist. These are kind of signs and symbols of what's to come, kind of foreshadowing. Um, yeah, and of course you mentioned like the intercession bit. But I guess where tradition, yeah, comes into play there is the church relying on how the earliest Christians understood that and kind of how that developed throughout time um, with that in mind, right? The idea of, the idea of, of development of doctrine is a, it's a thing in the Catholic church, right? Not that doctrine was just fixed and set like at this, you know, when John 2 was written, but that the Holy Spirit has, through the authority structure of the church, kind of revealed more depth to what this means so yeah, I, I mean, that's a great example of how that, that hermeneutic just sounds bonkers to, to anybody, 
apart from Catholics or Orthodox Christians, I suppose. But yeah, what it's rooted in is is some some deep stuff that goes back to kind of the beginning and how some of these early Christians understood those kind of exchanges. I don't even remember what our question was anymore. I'm just like rambling off on a tangent, I think. Who cares? This is great. <laughs> you know, forget the question. No, that was wonderful. Thank you. And I think that kind of leads into just this other uh, kind of I don't know, question I put down for you on this. And you bring up uh, the development of doctrine, which couldn't help but uh, remind me of that. What is it? Cardinal John Henry Newman with his uh, essays on the development of doctrine, where he has that infamous, I'll put it, uh, to be deep in history is to cease to be <laughs> Protestant, which if I had a dollar for every time someone put that on one of my uh, YouTube videos, man, I could uh, I could buy lots of books, which is probably all I'd do with it. But um, <laughs> so that idea of the development of doctrine, I, I think that that's an interesting one. And it kind of goes with the magisterium and the tradition. And I guess, so as a Protestant, I mean, I can agree, like, doctrine develops, like, I think that's fairly obvious. Like we, there's things that we know now that we might not have had fully obvious. Um, but I guess, so for me as a Protestant, though, the, the lens through which, I, or the filter for that is like, as these things come up, but, but does it align with scripture? That, that's like the basic Protestant question to ask of anything. Um, and so I don't know if this is a strange question, but essentially like, what can the church be wrong about and how does it not just become like and i mean maybe this is it and you know that that's whatever but like whatever the church says is automatically right and we don't have anything to kind of kind of like a check and balance of that and i know that's like enlightenment uh, governance not necessarily from the bible to be fair but i guess yeah so like what do we run that through like if uh, some bishop says something or a pope says obviously there's differences but i guess the core of the question is what can the catholic church be wrong about if anything and what decides that <laughs> that's a great question uh it's a really good question and I, I i would be interested okay so here's how i'd flip that around because this is this is where where i got to as uh an evangelical and i'm not saying that this is necessarily the the what would stump any evangelical this is where i got to personally to flip it around is what what check do I run it through as evangelical? I check it against the Bible, but then I've got like my friend over here who has a totally different interpretation of his Bible on what should be a pretty basic question, like take Jesus on divorce. I mean, to me, that seemed pretty, pretty clear. Like, don't divorce. Like, you know, looking at your looking at a person is adultery, you know, whatever somebody else that could be totally different interpretation on something pretty pretty straightforward on on the issue of baptism i mean it, there's places where it says baptism now saves you okay the other places where maybe it's not super clear so where i got to as the evangelical was well which of us is right and how do we know and i guess the difference in the catholic church is there there are times when the bishops and the Pope all in union kind of speak authoritatively and say, yes, this is an authoritative teaching. This is what you kind of must believe. There's room for debate. There's Catholic theologians who debate all kinds of things. The Catholic church is huge. I mean, you encountered, I know some of this, but people who hate Vatican II and people who love Vatican II and like, there's this yeah, whole spectrum. About that. Yeah. The Catholic church is a big church. I mean, and there's lots of conversation. The difference that, that I've, I learned, and I wrote about this in a blog post years ago when I was kind of first new Catholic. I wrote a post about how I love, I love Catholic infighting was kind of the title, I think. And it was a bit cheeky. But what, I, what, I, what the crux of the conversation was, the, the argument was, or the article was about, was, yeah, we're fighting and arguing about things that matter because we care about our theology. But in the end, we're all part of the same church. We're all part of the, under the same umbrella of authority. And if you don't want to be part of that, you can leave and stop being Catholic. You can't actually, which is funny. It's, you, you, it's impossible. That's an aside. But <laughs> you can leave the church, right? And say I'm not Catholic anymore. But there's room to debate within that church under, under the authority structure. Um, so what, what they would say, they, what the church says, it, 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 can't be, it can be wrong on, 
but the church says it can be wrong on are lots of things. So there's really not a whole lot of things that the church has said. These are things we can't be wrong about. I think one thing to understand how the church uses the Bible uh, is that the Catholic church can't be, can't teach things that the Bible teaches against. The church says like, no, this like scripture has an esteemed place within tradition. We can't one day start teaching that Jesus wasn't divine or that, you know, things that go against what's taught in scripture. The Catholic church can't teach against that. But at the same time, there, everything the Catholic church teaches is in seed form in the scriptures, but some things aren't explicitly going to be there. So we're okay with teaching things that aren't in scripture, as long as they aren't expressly forbidden in scripture. So the idea is that that's where the tradition kind of works things out and things kind of develop. Like it wasn't like, I guess the Trinity is kind of a, a, a maybe a decent example, maybe not. I'm not a professional apologist, so bear with me. Me neither. <laughs> but I mean, Christians didn't understand the Trinity the minute that Jesus came and taught and ascended into heaven. It wasn't like he left and we were like, oh yeah, like like three three persons. That's cool. We get it. That had to kind of get worked out. And there were, were there's a time when most of the world didn't believe in the Trinity. Like the Arian heresy was rampant and most Christians were Arians and didn't believe in the Trinity. Um, yet we believe that that Christ, the Holy Spirit, kind of preserved the church from falling into that heresy and eventually you know, the Trinitarian theology won out and that was what then all Christians came to believe. But that developed, right? That took a long time to develop, like 300 years to develop exactly what we understood that to mean, essentially. And so, yeah, so things develop, Catholic ideas develop. They can't contradict the Bible in the same way the Trinity couldn't contradict, you know, if Jesus came down and said, hey, I'm just two guys, don't say anything else, and then like left, we couldn't like invent the Trinity because that's contradicting clear scripture. So there's a check and balance there, if that makes sense, that mm -hmm. Catholic teaching can't contradict things in the Bible. Now, I guess the caveat is <laughs> that what non-Catholic Christians will object to in Catholicism is that, yeah, it contradicts stuff in the Bible. <laughs> like, it, you can't pray to the saints. It clearly says pray to Jesus. So I think when you encounter those things, I mean, that's just a misunderstanding of what is happening. On, on what Catholics are doing in those sense, in that sense, because the catechism is clear that our teaching can't contradict the Bible, um, even if it appears to, you know, there, let's calm down and talk about it and we can explain why Catholics believe it doesn't. I mean, you can still be convinced that it does at the end of the day. You can say, yeah, I don't know what, I, I hear your argument. I think you're praying to the saints still is idol worship, no matter what you say, but at least the, you know, the Catholic, perspective would be that from what we understand the Holy Spirit to have taught the church, it doesn't contradict the Bible. So I guess there's one check and balance there, but there's tons of things the church can be wrong about. I mean, our beloved Holy Father, Pope Francis, does these airplane interviews all the time, and he'll say the craziest things on this airplane full of reporters when he's coming back from Africa or, or Latin America or somewhere. Um, doesn't do a lot of flying these days because of COVID, but used to fly a lot and give these off the cuff interviews. He's famous for just talking off the cuff, right? And saying the craziest things, but those things don't become, you know, Catholic teaching because he said it or suggested it. There, there would have to be a clear kind of procedure in place. Bishops would have to get together and vote. The Pope would then issue kind of his authoritative teaching there's a, there's a formula that the Pope even uses when he's teaching from, we call it the seat of Peter, that's what the authority that Christ gave to Peter. I mean, the Pope is a whole other thing, but I mean, there, there, there are very few times when the church is, is speaking authoritatively, um, far fewer times than I think non-Catholic Christians think. And yeah, the church makes and has made all kinds of awful mistakes and terrible mistakes and done just the, the, the wonkiest things. I think one of the big misconceptions is that, you know, the Catholic Church believes that the Reformation had to happen. Like the Reformation was a good thing. It had to happen. The church was in a bad place in a lot of areas, you know, when Luther came and 
did his business and the reformers came and reformed the That <laughs> sounds like you at the washroom. That's not what I meant. <laughs> oh, that had to happen though, right? What the Catholic Church bemoans is that it didn't happen just within the church. It happened as a split from the church. Because what happened after Luther came and the reformers came is there was a reformation within the church. And the complaints that the reformers had that they made were addressed within the church at the Council of Trent, this huge, great big council that brought together all the bishops from across the world to kind of work things out and say, yeah, we've got to fix this. This has gone off, off the rails. So, I mean, there are things that the church can do wrong. And there have been crazy popes before. There have been terrible popes, um, just awful, like nutty people and terrible Catholics. And there still are. I mean, I guess at the end of the day, uh, some of the apostles were crazy. I mean, Peter denied Christ three times. There, there, there are not perfect people anywhere, I guess is the thing. But what the, what the church holds out is that as you said, I think, you know, we believe the Holy Spirit is infusing the church. And so people can be terrible, people can be wrong, people can make mistakes. But the core of the teaching of the church, what's laid out in the catechism, for example, is going to be what the church believes to be doctrine imparted by Christ, protected by the Holy Spirit, kind of carried down through time. And yeah, it develops. Yeah, it, it can change in the sense that we can understand it better. Not that it like it, all of a sudden, like one day, like Mary's like, no, not important anymore. Or like, you know, one day Christ isn't divine, something like radical like that, right? But it can develop, we can understand it a bit better, all guided by the Holy Spirit. So at the, you know, so the, the, the core isn't going to, I guess what we lean on is the idea that the gates of Hades won't, you know, won't overcome this church um, in the end. So, no, I mean, like, some popes are terrible. Some things that our current pope says are kind of crazy, but that's not the core of Catholic teaching. That's, you know, kind of housed in that magisterium, which right now we have in the catechism because it's all kind of been collected in there. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And, you know, I think one of the most interesting experiences for me as I've been I mean, I've just been trying to consume as much quality content on this as I can. Um, Don't listen to my podcast then, Austin, because oh, you're, man, you're I've already in the wrong up. place. You've, uh, you set me up for failure. No, not at all. I've, I've listened to a lot of great podcasts from you. I really appreciate the work you're doing. Um, but I was, you know, so, yeah, I mean, being in this position of being surrounded with this, like, primarily Catholic audience, trying to not make a complete fool of myself while also just being, like, real open and honest as I do it. Uh, like trying to engage with good good people on this. And one of the just really interesting moments was I was listening to a video, I think it was from Matt Pratt. Um, and he made this comment, he was talking to Cameron Bertuzzi, another a Protestant YouTuber. And he said this, Cameron was asking questions about the papacy. And he basically said like, oh yeah, there were terrible popes. Like there might be popes in hell. And I was like, you're allowed to say that? Like I had just, that, that kind of really made me step back and go, okay, what I, thought the Catholic ter Church taught about the papacy isn't quite what, I, uh, what it is. And then learning about the distinctions between impeccability and infallibility and all of that good stuff. But I guess, so I, mean, I think you got to this, but is, at the end of the day, so there have been bad popes and, you know, Pope Francis might say some crazy things. Is it the Catholic belief that because of like the, um, Jesus's promise to the church and the work of the Holy Spirit that like, it's just impossible that tomorrow Pope Francis would speak ex cathedra and say, yeah, by the way, we're Arians or something like, like, is it just like, I get that. So there's this idea, it can't contradict scripture. Is that because it's not allowed to, or it just won't? Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes, I think that makes a lot of sense. That's a fantastic question. And I would, I would say that, I mean, I guess it comes down to what, how we understand that promise that Jesus has made that the gates of hell will not overcome the church. Uh, and then given kind of Peter, the keys to the kingdom, which is how kind of Catholics understand the papacy to kind of come from. Um, which again, like people don't believe that. I get it. I get it. I get it, I get it that non-Catholic Christians don't believe that. There is good, 
reason why Catholics believe that. Sometimes it's a crazy thing that we've, we've made up or was made up during the Middle Ages. It's, it's, it's got deep roots. I think one thing that a lot of, um, I mean, okay, let me back up for a second here. One of the interesting things that, that I learned when I became Catholic, I was becoming Catholic, is the idea that somebody might point to like a Marian dogma or the idea of the Pope being infallible or, or the Pope being this special person, kind of, the, you know, above all the bishops, all the other bishops. They might point to that and say, oh, this is just like decided on in like 1910 or something. Like, why do you believe that? That's crazy. Or like 1950. Uh, the, the important thing I think to understand about Catholic uh, dogma and doctrine and belief, and maybe you already understand this, Austin, is that these things are defined when they're challenged. The Catholic Church isn't going around being like, oh, you believe this and this and this and this, and like you must subscribe to all these things before becoming Catholic or you can't be Catholic. All these things that Catholics believe were kind of worked out only when it was really challenged. In the same way that like the Trinity, for example, was kind of worked out when it was challenged, when other people who believe different things kind of began to promote their idea that was challenged. And so, you know, a, a council was held and like, and the bishops voted and, and, and talked and discussed and figured out what we actually believe. And then that became kind of the standard norm for uh, Christian belief guided by the Holy Spirit. Like those things happen guided by the Holy Spirit. So I guess in the same way that we would say, yeah, the Holy Spirit is guiding this church into truth. So whatever mechanism is used to prevent Pope Francis from saying something crazy, ex cathedra, whatever mechanism is used to make sure that the church doesn't start teaching some wacky doctrine, whether it's like he'd be struck by lightning, maybe he began speaking and saying something like, like that, or whether he, you know, whether he wouldn't be elected in the first place. Uh, in, I don't know what the mechanism would be, but we believe, yeah, that the Holy Spirit would, would do something to guide the church towards what the truth is in the same way that it would have guided the church towards understanding what the Trinity was. Like, I don't know. I don't know if, if God prevented certain bishops from making it to like Nicaea, for example, to like vote on these things or whether, whether those bishops just weren't elected in the first place or whether, whether God was like, okay, we need like 20 bishops here and like 50 here. So I can't have any more elected that would teach this heresy I don't, I don't know if, if he was like doing the math to figure out like the votes or something, but, uh, but something would, you know, something would happen to prevent that error from being taught. And I think it's cool that there have been times in history when it's come very close to, to things that we don't believe in mean, happening. Like we became, we became very close to being, to being Aryans, I guess, uh, the whole of Christianity, but yet we, the Holy Spirit guided us kind of back from that brink, in a sense. And there have been popes who have been terrible, right? But God prevented them in some way. The Holy Spirit prevented them in some way from teaching error or teaching crazy things. Uh, you know, popes that, that had like concubines on the side or whatever, never, never went around teaching that that was okay. Never spoke in, a way, in an authoritative sense to, they lived immoral lives. They weren't good people and <laughs> maybe they're in hell. I don't know. But, but they never led others through their teaching down those kind of routes. They didn't look good as people. That, that moral example would have been miserable uh, and was miserable and is miserable. I mean, it's, it's awful that those popes now are in history and would discourage other people from becoming Catholic because we have like these horrible popes. Like it's awful that there, there are those examples that prevent people from being like, oh yeah, the church is great. Like, no, those popes, like, hold us all back, which is, like, terrible. But the Holy Spirit did prevent them from, from teaching, like, their errors apart from living terrible lives. Does that make sense? Does that answer your yeah, question? Yeah, I think it does. A little bit. It does, yeah. And I, I think that's a helpful distinction. Gosh, there's so many, like, I could do this all night. There's different ways I want to take this. Um, but I guess... <laughs> Yeah, we'll we'll just dive straight into uh, the controversy because I I still don't get it and it ties into this. So, okay, I unknowingly launched myself into what seems to be one of the uh, biggest. Like, I don't know if it's really one of the biggest controversies in the Catholic Church. 
unbeknownst to me, I just thought, hey, I'll go to a Latin mass and then I'll go to a Novus Ordo and I'll make this video on it. And it's going to be great because it's like these two different services and it'll just be fun and everyone's going to love it and tell me, wow, that was great. Uh, <laughs> turns out there's some disagreement on those things and <laughs> around Vatican II and I realized I jumped into something I knew, no idea what I was getting myself into. So I guess the question is like Vatican II, that's an ecumenical council. <laughs> and I've got all these Catholics, I mean, at least so claiming, commenting like Vatican II is garbage for Protestants, yada, 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 uh, Masonic infiltration, yada, yada. Like, and look, like this is all over my head and we don't have to get into the weeds of that because I'm sure you want your audience to still like you at the end of this. And I, don't, I probably won't understand anyway, but I get the central thing, like, can you be a Catholic and say Vatican II is wrong? <laughs> um, oh, <laughs> this is such an interesting you topic. Go. You know what? And it's and it's it's it disappoints me. And I've talked to other Catholic friends and apologists that I know. Um, you mentioned a while ago that you encountered these, and I've I've, I've seen the comments on your videos, and I'm like, oh no, that's too bad. But there is this, I mean, and I will, I will lose, I lose friends and listeners, not friends. I might lose some listeners to comment like this. But I mean, I, I had a while back on this show, a wonderful priest called Father Blake uh, Brighton from uh, Word on Fire. Bishop Barron uh, is a very popular YouTuber, uh, uh, a Catholic bishop, does a, lot of, does a lot of work in new media. And I, I had uh, Father uh, Brighton on the show because he has done... Uh, like a master's thesis on Vatican II and studied the documents. And he wrote an article for Word on Fire about Vatican II, what it was all about. And the crux of his, I mean, the kind of his thesis, which I fully subscribe to, and I think a lot of intelligent people, intelligent Catholics who, who have a, a decent perspective on things subscribe to, is, and I'll just say this, that people who say Vatican II was wrong don't understand what Vatican II was. Or what it did, or what it, or what it said, and I think if, and so there's this unfortunate kind of substring happening. I don't know. It's slightly political. It's slightly kind of an undercurrent connected with American politics in a sense. Um, and unfortunately, it's it's got a little bit tangled up together. As a Canadian, I look at it and I get a little bit confused because I am. We don't have American politics. We have, we're Canada. We're just hanging up, hanging out up here, just with the snow and stuff. But maple it is syrup and just living the life. Yeah, the maple syrup is important. So we're also happy all the time. This is so sweet. We, uh, in all seriousness, no, there seriousness though. There is this kind of yeah strange undercurrent of this Latin Mass versus Vatican II, this Novus Ordo versus like the traditional Latin Mass. What it comes down to, I think, is, you know, Vatican II was this ecumenical council that happened kind of 60s, 70s, during a time of crazy change in the world, right? It, it had to happen. I think most Catholics would tell you it had to happen. The church needed to kind of decide what it believed on all kinds of things and really kind of reframe itself as, as Catholic populations were changing. I mean, the, the Catholic Church for a long time was this church of, in North America, this church of like the immigrant, you know, they'd come make these small little enclaves, the t Italian section of town, the Irish section of town, like the, where there'd be Catholic churches and strong, you know, family structures and the parish would have a, a school attached to it. And so your life as a Catholic was, was, was in your little Catholic enclave as a Catholic. And a lot of the education that happened in these different uh, for Catholics, prior to this kind of time, what were, was through the family and through the parish and through your community, your neighbors were all Catholic, where you live was kind of the Catholic part of town. And so that's how you'd learn about things. And I think as, it's funny to say now, but as like TV came along and like information began to be disseminated easier and like, it's funny enough because the internet I kind of, and, and shifted all that in a sense. But Back then, things were began moving very, very quickly, and things were changing, and people were moving out of these places. And so, and and 
society was changing. Like it was the sixties, right? All these different, a lot of, a time of lots of change and dismantling of different kinds of institutions and ideas of family and, and, you know, contraception and sexual revolution changed all kinds of things and all these different dynamics were at play. So the church held this kind of council, second Vatican council, to kind of deal with these things and, and reframe some ideas on and, and how we understood these things. And a lot of it was going back to the, the sources, the sources of the early church and those writings of the early church to kind of re-understand or kind of re-look at the roots of the Catholic faith and then present that kind of afresh to, to a new generation. And these kind of things have been happening forever. Like there have been councils kind of forever. This was kind of the most recent big one. And I think what happened, and this is my understanding based on things I've read from priests like Father Blake Brighton, who expresses this very well, is that there was the council. So what the council taught, and then there's kind of the spirit of the council. And so what the council taught is, is available for us to read in a number of these documents. You can find them. They're, they're, they're brilliant documents. A lot of people have become Catholic reading these documents because they, they explain things so well and they're, and they're very poignant. But the, the council, what it actually decided upon were, were these documents. And then in the second kind of strain was kind of what people were hoping the council might do and kind of how people interpreted those documents and weren't necessarily the way the documents were intended to be interpreted or, or were written. There's a bit of maybe willful kind of, well, we hope the church would kind of more, would, would go more modern or more liberal in these areas and how we worshiped and how we express ourselves and how we're ecumenical and how we understand our place in the world and these different things that weren't really in these documents that the church actually created and voted upon and authoritatively kind of released, it was more like, uh, how we'll kind of read them or hope that they, hope they sounded. And so out of this kind of came this, this strain of very kind of, I don't know, can I say loosey goosey? <laughs> like it's your podcast, you can say whatever friend. you want. I can, can't I? Uh, this very kind of like anything goes kind of Catholicism. And so things like the Novus Ordo, like the, 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 the new mass, like the way of doing mass where the priest faces the people and everything's in English. And it's, it's, it's similar. It's very, I mean, it's basically the same as what the Latin mass was. They just turned the priest around for certain reasons and saying things in English um, and kind of refined how things happen. But what happened in a lot of cases is, you know, that does come from, some of the ideas that Vatican II presented, but it was kind of taken to the max, right? And really, let's just really water this down, make the mass easy for anyone to come to, make it really accessible and really simple. And let's take this beautiful cathedral and paint it all white so it's nice, you know, it doesn't look scary with images and icons. It was this sense of kind of making Catholicism more palatable for anybody to, to, to be a part of, really. I mean, there's a good strain in that, but at the same time, a lot of things were lost in that. And a lot of people took it, took it to kind of an extreme. So the spirit of the council was much more extreme kind of interpretation of what the council intended. And so as a result, there's been kind of a pushback, I think, with this idea of the Latin mass. So the, the mass was in Latin, which was, which was the common language at the time when it was, you know, when the early church was emerging, Latin was kind of the, the, the language of the people. As that went down through time, that became less and less the case and became kind of this, this less accessible idea, which in part is why the Novus Ordo was developed to make it more accessible for good reasons for Catholics, right? To understand what's happening and, and get a bit more out of the mass uh, in terms of understanding what's happening there. But, you know, as a pushback to kind of some of those really extreme examples of the Novus Ordo, uh, the Latin mass became kind of this, this, the, I don't know, the safe haven for people who really hated that stuff that was happening there. And there was a good reason to, to push back against some of those really extreme versions of, of the new mass, uh, certainly. And I mean, I'm not a scholar of the mass. I don't know all the ins and outs of, of some of these reasons why those things were so terrible. But there is a sense that some of the reverence and worship and, and awe, the Latin mass kind of uh, presented, I think you've seen this yourself, 
some yeah. of that some of that is is lost in in some ways that some priests celebrate the novus ordo mass so the controversy is exists in there um and there's there's good reasons that that exists certainly but at the same time it, it has been kind of in a sense in some cases politicized and kind of become this thing that well some people are abusing vatican ii in these ways so the whole thing must be wrong it must be evil it's this conspiracy plot of the masons um i mean that in large measure is tied up in some of these discussions that i think come out of american politics in some cases i don't know if bill gates is involved in the Novus ordo as well i'm not super sure uh as a canadian i'm kind of sitting on the fence just kind of looking down there not totally sure what's happening but there is a lot of that kind of strain of thought, uh, you know, that Vatican II is a kind of a conspiracy or that it was totally wrong. It's, and it's often rooted in kind of a misunderstanding. Like Pope Benedict allowed the Latin Mass to continue to be celebrated, which is fantastic because it's, it's a beautiful form of the Mass. As you've seen, it's super reverent. It's, it's um, in many cases, very different than how you'd see Novus Ordo Mass celebrated. Mind you, if a Novus Ordo Mass is celebrated, uh, it can be, can be very, very reverent at the same time. The problem is that it's sometimes not, um, but it can be. And so there is that. People that, that want to seek that more reverent version of, of the Mass, that think it should be super reverent, which it should, and sometimes, oftentimes isn't in Novus Ordo Mass, seek that that latin mass and there's a valid place for that latin mass for sure but it never should be pitted against like everything else i don't think and i think to answer your question in a very long and rambling <laughs> rendition it is just a misunderstanding of what vatican ii aimed to do that causes people to say that it was wrong or it was um it was not not valid that gets into territory where you are quickly becoming not catholic there's there and there's a strain of people who who have gone that far um they're called set of contests who believe that the pope isn't actually the pope and there's many different i mean there's a guy called pope michael who says that he's the pope who has a congregation of i think 12 people somewhere in middle america who he has a twitter account and it's actually very interesting to follow him on Twitter because he tweets some interesting things, but he calls himself Pope Michael and he thinks that he's the Pope uh, because the, the real Pope, you know, broke from the Latin mass and, and isn't valid anymore. But yeah, you become increasingly less Catholic as you head down that route. And I don't know at what point, I mean, canon lawyers would know this. People who study church teaching in more depth than I do would know at what point you stop being Catholic, but it, it's a rabbit hole. I'm sorry that you have been exposed to that rabbit hole. It, it, it breaks my heart. It does because the Catholic church is this united church where there is room for agreement or sorry, room for disagreement around what we believe. The catechism tells you what we believe. There's room for disagreement around things that aren't settled matters of doctrine and dogma. But I don't know. There are people who are, who, who, I don't know, are pushing at the walls to kind of, I don't know, half out the window with the, I don't know, busting with their elbow or something that really aren't in that church anymore. But I don't know. It's, it is what it is. It's unfortunate that you encountered it because it's a dark kind of sad, I don't know, underbelly of what is a beautiful church that has a lot going on. But it comes down to, I think, misunderstanding. Yeah, that's helpful. And I think you, and sorry to, I feel like I put you on the spot into the, I threw you into the lion's den with that one. Um, hey. I guess I went and was like, you're coming with me, Keith. Help, uh, <laughs> Let's go. Give me a tour of this lion's den. It's but scary down here. I, I think you, it is, yeah. But also, you know, I, I guess I want to balance that with, oh, while on those videos I posted there have, been some infighting i would say for every like i don't know vatican II is terrible blah 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 comment there's been so many people that have expressed something like you like calling for okay guys like 
let, let's do this civilly, like let's figure this out. And I've been amazed by the support that I've gotten on so many videos. Just people have been so kind. I mean, two people sent me books today. I was like, I love books, that's great. Um, but yeah, so I guess you hit on kind of an intuition that I had there that it felt like to go out and say like, not just like the direct, not just the outcome of this was bad, but the council itself is wrong is to kind of distance yourself from Catholicism. Because again, as I research all of this, you know, seeing that centerpiece, the, the linchpin being the church's authority. When I got into this world where there's all these people saying, okay, yes, we have this authoritative church, but our ecumenical council is wrong. It kind of was a bit head spinning because it seemed to kind of grind against the, the grain of the teaching there. Yeah, absolutely. And I, it, 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 yeah, it does. And that's where I mean, this, this to me, Matthew 18, I think it's Matthew 18, was kind of a linchpin for me. I remember bringing Matthew 18, where, where Christ is talking about how to resolve disputes in the church. And he says, you know, bring, bring one other brother, then bring two, bring it to the church. If they, don't, if they don't agree with you, then like, they're as a tax collector or a sinner to you. You kind of, you know, you're, they're out of this this thing that for me i remember bringing that verse to i was well on my way down the rabbit hole looking towards the catholic church and i brought this verse to my my evangelical pastor as kind of a last this last last ditch effort to say hey like i don't get this like help me out here help me not become catholic um i was a bit desperate um, my wife was totally in the dark and it was going to be a, a bad scene I'm like help me <laughs> stop and my issue with that, and this goes into your question, I think, was how do we know what the church is, right? If if me and another Catholic are in dispute, or if me and another Christian are in dispute about something, we, okay, so as an evangelical, this is what I brought to my pastor, if we're in dispute, I can just, you know, bring someone else who to deal with this. Okay, this is the third person involved. They always talk about this. We can't agree. Bring it to the church. Well, this church says this about marriage, and this other church here says this about marriage, and this other church here says nothing about marriage because they have no opinion at all about marriage. So, so my question to him was, well, which church is right? Like when Christ says, bring it to the church, and they can rule, and they can kind of cast you out of that church if you won't submit to what they say is right. What church was the right church? I think this goes to to your question a bit in the sense that what I found in the Catholic church, and again, my pastor had no real answer for me, which is disappointing. He was like, well, I don't know. Like oh, that's a complicated verse to deal with because there are, these are different churches. And if you don't like what I say, you can go join a different church and they will agree with you. And so I don't know. But what I found in the Catholic church is that there is this clear authority structure of who's in and who's out, which makes sense in the case of, of Matthew 18, because what Christ is saying is, if you don't agree with this, what the church says, you can be out of the church. There's a clear thing you can be out of. My challenge was, if all these churches are just separate silos, I can be out of this church, but over here in this church. So how do I ever really know if I'm out of the church? In the Catholic world, when, when thinking about all kinds of things, right? So somebody doesn't agree with the teaching of, of the current Pope doesn't agree with Vatican II, doesn't agree with, with what the church says about marriage or sexuality or the Eucharist or baptism. Somebody can disagree with those things, but they're clearly outside of the boundaries of the church because here's what the church says. Here's what we teach it's in the catechism. You go to your bishop, you ask him, he'll say, yeah, we teach this. If you don't believe that, like you're putting yourself outside of that structure of the church. And it's really quite clear what that structure is. Someone that says Vatican II isn't a valid council, well, they're putting themselves outside of the structure of what the church says, because the church has affirmed Vatican II with the authority that it has, right? They said, like, you know, the bishops got together, they voted, this is the result of what they've voted upon, all these different documents, the kind of outline teaching. If you don't agree with that, well, you're not, you're, you're putting yourself outside of that authority. So there is an authority there, it's clearly defined. It's, we can find it in our catechism. You can go ask your bishop. He'll tell you. Ask your priest. He'll tell you. But you don't have to agree with that, right? You can put yourself outside of that. 
and it's quite clear, um, different than how we've understood that as an evangelical, because it wouldn't always be super clear. Because I could just go down the street, like, and you can. I mean, you can join what's called the old Catholic Church, and they're a Catholic Church that doesn't believe the Vatican II. I think I don't know all their theology, but they're they're they believe that they're the true Catholic Church, and they're called the old Catholic Church. Um, they're not the Catholic Church. Like they're not in continuity with with the bishops who have you know succeeded the apostles. Um, Pope Michael does not have any kind of valid succession with anybody, even though he might say that he does. And some some renegade bishop who was then excommunicated would have ordained him. It's, it's crazy. There's I mean, there are crazy things in the Catholic Church apart from the theology. There's just weird things going on in some corners of the church. But it's clear. It's clear whether you're in or you're out, if you compare what you are saying and believing with the actual views of the Catholic Church. So, I mean, I would never say, yeah, this guy's not Catholic because he's saying Vatican II is not valid. But, if, but if, if he's going to go look at the documents of the Catholic Church and say, no, nah, this isn't true, I think he's putting himself outside of what are some pretty clear boundaries. Does that make sense? It does, yeah, and that's really helpful. And I think the distinction at the very end there, I don't, maybe this is or isn't what you're making, um, but I think there's also a difference between holding an opinion that is, you haven't fully investigated and being wrong about it versus willfully like looking into something and saying, I've seen all of this, it's wrong. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's helpful. And it's been, I'll just say it's been interesting as a uh, outsider to, to look at all of this and get to see it and, and the good, I mean, again, I don't want to like focus so much on the infighting. I've seen a lot of beautiful things, um, had so many people reach out so kindly. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's been a wild ride just getting to, uh, to learn all of this and, uh, really enjoying it. <laughs> and you're right. Again, you're very thoughtful in your approach to this, right? It, in many cases, it's, it's people that have not thought probably through these things very deeply or hold the things that are really at a surface level maybe and digging into these things. I mean, understanding the nuance between what the council actually taught and how some people interpreted it. it. It's a nuance. But when you dig into those things, I think those things become clear. So again, I think like the Catholics who maybe sold the best drugs at my high school campus would have been in league with people who, again, don't really know the, the nuances to do with some of these ideas of, um, of Vatican II or the Latin Mass or these beautiful, beautiful things that when we've looked into at a surface level, but maybe not dug, I think, deeply enough to have a super awesome handle on it. I can say it that way. And I want to be charitable. I want to, I want to try and channel some of that Austin uh, attitude <laughs> in what I'm saying, but I probably can't. Uh, the cordial Catholic, it's a moniker I'm trying to grow into. And I don't know. I don't know how I'm doing. <laughs> That's such a great name, though. I love the, uh, the alliteration there. But yeah, and I mean, maybe, I, you know, I think, um, I think there's plenty of people that would say perhaps I'm overly charitable and that We'll listen through this episode and be like, but why didn't you like dig in on this or that? And I just want to take a second to say to those people, like, I see myself as trying to do my best to learn, to understand the position before I go out and say, well, this is wrong because of this. Like, if I, if I don't understand what I'm dialoguing with, there's no sense in trying to like tear something down. Um, and yeah, I think that's also just perhaps not the best approach. Um, so to all the Protestants that listen to this and they're disappointed, there's far smarter Protestants to go listen to and hear their take on it. And I encourage you to do that. And uh, if for whatever reason you want to listen to a guy just like process all this, I guess you can come check me out. But uh, yeah, I think that's just, I want to just reiterate again, there's, there's people that can express this so much better than me. And while there are things that I disagree with, I'm still just trying to figure out what is it that I'm actually disagreeing with and why before I come up with like this big case or something. <laughs> then you come back for a part two. You, you just tear me apart. That'd be a great kind of uh, <laughs> conclusion. No, no. Just <laughs> yeah, that's not what I'm trying to set up. <laughs> the most out of character, just like attack on my faith. That would be pretty, oh, the dark side. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I uh, I wouldn't hold your breath on that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, and I guess a point I want to make is I, I think sometimes people see my approach and assume that I just think like truth doesn't matter or yeah, like whatever you believe, it's all cool. Like I care deeply about these things and, and you do too. And I think, um, I guess what I'd want to point out to people is that like we can have these conversations while disagreeing and have them fruitfully without going to one extreme of just like shouting each other down or the other extreme of just saying like, eh, it's all the same. It doesn't really matter. Like, you know, whatever floats your boat. <laughs> I think you're so right. And honestly, that's that your approach is what I find so refreshing and, and so such a needed and necessary and important approach. Like you said, it, it, we disagree on a lot of things, but you have to understand the position of the person you're disagreeing with. You have to understand what they believe and what they're thinking and, and, and listen. I mean, I think those things are so valuable. It, again, it goes back to the idea of, of the weirdness. Like this, this kind of sets aside the weirdness Focus on, on, on things that, that we believe and hold and understand those things better. And I mean, then use that to, to form for the dialogues and, and form y- your own understanding in more depth. Uh, that's way more fruitful than just yelling and, and arguing back and forth, I think. And so I'm thankful for you for having those kinds of conversations and be willing, being willing to have them with me here. This has been phenomenal. Um, I think this is probably a good place to end unless you have any like last minute mic drops where like, Oh, why do you do this? And you want to just, you know, take off that super kind smile and like, and like tear into me. Um, I don't think it's going to happen. So I think we're probably safe to, no, I don't to think wrap so. things up. Um, yeah. Thanks for having me though. This has been uh, such a pleasure. Hey, this has been like, I mean, I've been looking forward to this for a long time since it went in the calendar. This has been an absolute treat for me. Uh, your channel is fantastic. I love the stuff you are doing there. Um, I'm sorry the Catholics have invaded you and taken over. That doesn't seem fair, but hopefully you're enjoying the wild ride that has resulted. <laughs> I think it's amazing. Um, why don't you tell people who are listening to this podcast uh, where to go to find you in your videos and maybe a bit about, I don't know, what else you want to share with them? Yeah. Well, if you want to listen to uh, me for whatever reason, you're more than welcome to do that at uh, Gospel Simplicity on YouTube. I'm Gospel Simplicity on Instagram and Facebook as well. I post twice a week. One of those is uh, where we do a series called Life in the Word, where we go through different books of the Bible, one chapter at a time. Right now we're in John, and I know all of my Catholic audience cannot wait till I get to John chapter six, and I'm beginning to question that. why I ever signed up for this, but now I'm excited for it. Um, And then I do other videos um, broadly about life, Jesus, and the journey of faith. And a lot of the most popular ones are these ecumenical discussions. I'm really enjoying that. Um, So yeah, if you're into that kind of thing, you're more than welcome to check it out. And yeah, I guess one last thing I'd leave the audience with is um, I would just say, you know, what really started me on this whole journey of like, why am I even talking to Catholics about Catholicism, like I'm an evangelical Bible student, uh, is I would say, you know, a couple of years ago, I went to a Catholic Bible study and was surrounded by like 60 guys that were getting there for a Bible study at 5.30 in the morning, which is just hateful. I don't know why any Bible study would start at that time. But before I was ever introduced to the intellectual arguments for Catholicism, I was introduced to guys that genuinely loved Jesus and wanted to be better followers of Christ, better husbands, etc. And that's what even opened the door for me to look into any of this. So I would just encourage the listeners out there, like, you might not be able to argue Catholicism, but you can open up these conversations by just living out your faith well. And yeah, that's been big for me. So just an encouragement to you guys out there. <laughs> that's fantastic. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your time. This has been an absolute thrill. I really enjoyed this. Hopefully you have, hopefully listeners have as well. Uh, Thank you so much. I want to say God bless you, Austin, your studies, your ministry, the fantastic work you're doing for the church. And thank you so much 
for being here.